name is Liam Rosa. Uh, I'm the uh, leader of uh, Project LifeScope. And uh, I got a question for you. Yes. Yeah, question. <laughs> Have you heard the hype, guys? It turns out our phones are going to be tricorders. Our glasses are going to be holodecks. We're going to go to places before we go to them. We're going to see all the cool stuff before we're actually in the cool places. We're going to have spirit animals that are going to take us to uh, direct us and give us directions to everywhere we go. And then, you know, once we go to the store, they're going to cry and say they're going to die if we don't buy stuff at the store. It's going to be great. And school is going to be really cool. It's going to be amazing. You know, the hype is real. In fact, there's science behind how much the hype is real. Uh, this is uh, a very phallic piece of future art hype cycle of emerging technologies. Anybody ever seen this hype cycle chart before? It's really fascinating. It essentially says that like technology, as it comes into the world, goes through different stages between, uh, between the idea all the way into production. And uh, the hype doesn't quite match up to, uh, to actually its maturity. And this tries to, tries to place all these different emerging technologies from energy, to uh, my favorite of the digital twin and uh, general artificial intelligence. But over here, coming up on the slope of enlightenment, we have augmented and virtual reality, uh, uh, followed by some of my other favorite technologies. I will definitely check this out later. Uh, I, I absolutely love the hype. I'm always captured by it. This is a photo of me a decade ago trying to, trying to chase uh, all these emerging technologies. Uh, it wasn't, it, you know, <laughs> None of this ARVR stuff was ready then. It's, it's just starting to get there now. Uh, so I love making this, this, this magical, uh, uh, these magical experiences, writing this magical software. Uh, up top here is some of, some of my favorites and some of the best uh, examples I've seen in AR, VR, machine learning being brought to the consumer. And if you want to do this, you want to make some magical piece of next-gen tech, you have to walk between the software and the hardware, and everything between the software and hardware is laid out here. Under apps, we have libraries and frameworks, and so languages live. Then uh, we have, uh, we get down lower and lower until we start to hit the OS level APIs. That, then we start getting into assembly, the actual speed pieces of dedicated hardware, and then to the devices themselves. And when you're making software, uh, that's really rich, you, you have to essentially navigate this whole labyrinth. And uh, the two guides that people use are Unity and Unreal right now. It's kind of the major thing to build a, build a platform that can get, get your access to the, uh, get your software access to the hardware and back again with performance, get you that 3D rendering, get you that uh, uh, computer vision, get you machine learning, get you access to sensors. <coughs> Let's continue. So let's uh, slice off a piece of that first. Let's talk about the state of, of the XR, AR, VR, everything in between. Uh, AR uh, really is going to hit us in the broad market first in our phones. And the first way it's going to be delivered to our phones is through the app stores. If you're on iOS or Android, you're getting AR through I, uh, AR Kit and AR Core. Uh, you can see right here, they're about comparably matched, um, and this, this chart's getting updated all the time. Uh, going. And then if you want to do VR, uh, there's several options out there. Probably everybody's familiar with standalone, tethered, phone based AR out there. Uh, it's a whole ocean of uh, different, uh, different devices and uh, all sorts of uh, problems trying to target most, if not all of them. Uh, then we get to the AR world. Uh, I bet most of you are familiar or are not familiar with uh, many of these headsets, but there is a pretty interesting AR ecosystem that's starting to boot up. I'm sure most of you are aware of where the uh, Magic Leap is about to, to drop here, and some of these other headsets are starting to get a lot broader adoption. Over here is some of my favorites that nobody knows about, uh, which is the open source headsets. Um, let's keep going. Then some of the other ways that AR and VR is coming. Uh, projection mapping uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, projection AR. Uh, this is one of my favorite systems, uh, uh, the light form, just kind of showing how cheap this stuff is. And then uh, other forms of AR, uh, perspective 3D. Uh, this, this is AR wall right here, uh, doing perspective uh, augmented reality. Uh, there's other companies, other frameworks like Headshot doing it uh, for free too. 
And this is all different ways that we can see uh, XR starting to uh, come online. Uh, and really what's, what's underneath all this stuff uh, when the, uh, that's helping us power it, that I think it's a little, very little uh, attention is actually the sensors themselves. This is probably the most talked about sensor of the last two years. Does anybody know what this is? It's really easy, yeah. It's the, uh, it's the true depth module that you see on the iPhone X. Uh, Apple um, actually bought three different uh, modules and glued them together for about $16. They're actually kind of worth $16 now. It's about $8 to manufacture. The really amazing uh, uh, technology that they have, and you can see right here, that's a it's a dot projector, infrared camera, an RGB camera, and it's able to do all sorts of um, spatial, uh, spatial sensing. You can also see there's a long list of other types of sensors out there. I'll, let me show you a few more sensors that you don't know about that are coming online that are going to enable some amazing experiences. Here's one in ultra low power uh, coming out of Cornell University, uh, really made the public about a month and a half ago. This is a 1080p camera that works at about 15 frames per second and requires no battery. You hook up this antenna and it picks off power from ambient EM, uh, runs the camera, and then transmits the video back over ambient EM. And this chip's $11 going into production at the end of September. Pretty crazy, right? Want to see another sensor you probably haven't heard about? This one was announced Monday by Sony. It's 48 megapixels. That's not an inch, that's a centimeter. Okay, uh, that's so. Just imagine the photogrammetry you could do off this. What uh, you know, uh, and it's uh, coming to a cell phones near you, uh, and arriving via DSLRs. And uh, I just showed you guys an ocean of, of XR hardware. What's what's really the takeaway from this? It's they're, they're very similar, similar optics, similar software, similar sensors, and similar things. Uh, now let's jump into the next part of uh, the new wave of software magic, deep learning. Uh, you guys know this guy, Jensen, yeah. CEO of, of, uh, uh, of uh, NVIDIA. He has made uh, quite a fat piece of coin off, uh, the, off machine learning, crypto, and a few other things. Uh, one thing that he, he got a lot of no, notoriety in the press is he called what we're going through the Cambrian explosion of deep learning. Well, what does that mean? Well, when I started in school, deep learning, uh, machine learning was pretty primitive. And about five years ago, deep learning exploded, just the same way the Cambrian explosion happened. And we have now gotten a whole set of species and subspecies of machine learning. You can see them right here. I won't go through them. Uh, the, some of them are good for some things, some for others. Some, they, they can be combined together for a certain task. Uh, certain software stacks run some and not the others well. But uh, there's a whole, you know, just ocean of innovation happening right now. Uh, they're all different and they're all similar. Yeah, they're all specialized uh, uh, to do certain tasks. It goes through a, a phase of training and then a phase of inference. This is one of my favorites. It, it has to do with uh, computer vision, which is what I'll focus on today. And what you can see is this one is a computer vision inference ver uh, trained version of this model that's going out and uh, analyzing any photos of baseball. It can pick out people, their positions, the balls and the bats. This one here is going and uh, picking out animals. Now you can use this in a hierarchical way. So it picks out a person and then hands out an image and then hands that cut out to a, a sub-person computer vision AI who can then figure out the pose and who that is and the gender and the race and the age. Same thing with these animals. They can be used hierarchically infinite depth. Uh, and really my favorite use case where this is revolutionizing right, the world right now is towards climate change and agriculture. Uh, the amount of investment and the amount of power going into computer vision and deep learning around these two problems I think is just paramount. And it's going hand in hand with robotics. I absolutely love these. This is satellite image data essentially judging the health of the biome, helping with city planning. And then these, these are robotics with computer vision on them uh, being deployed in the field right now by companies like Monsanto and, uh, and John Deere to actually uh, go and uh, do all sorts of spatial optimization. Just kind of an idea of where, of, of, of just how incredibly transformative this type of tech is. 
And uh, going back to photogrammetry, you know, uh, photogrammetry is getting a huge kick from AI right now. It started with robotics and it went everywhere. We just saw some really high-end, very deliberate uh, photogrammetry where, where um, all the images were taken for the sake of photogrammetry. This is an office reconstructed with photogrammetry just from social media feeds. And the really amazing part is, is, there's, is there's AI now that can fill in all the gaps and then take the geodata and place it into a larger context. And the larger context is geodata. See, the thing that people don't realize is when you look at Google Maps, you're really seeing an image of three to six months ago that Google picked out for that location. But we have data of every 18 hours. We have stuff coming from satellites, drones, forms of devices like uh, your smart car, like Tesla, they collect a lot of geodata. And we're going to have access to a digital time machine. It's just having the right database access rights. Um, and it's going to be the backbone of which the metaverse is going to build on because it's what's going to place all this photogrammetry and all this rich data into the world. Uh, and that's where the Chronos Group comes in. Chronos uh, uh, Group is creating and maintaining essentially the pipeline uh, to build all the 3D, uh, all the, the 3D logic and then do it uh, in virtual reality and augmented reality, layer on parallel computing, all these great pieces of machine learning on top of it. And uh, they're doing a great job. They're getting all the boats, all the oars in the water, all the boats going in the same direction. We're all getting to the same, the, the same destination. Um, and uh, we're doing this around common formats. I think we talked about uh, OpenXR got called out. I could go, I could get on, this, on my soapbox and talk about all of these for a really long time, but I won't. Uh, the, the, the big point is, uh, You've got to follow this guy, Neil Trevitt. He is the uh, vice president of NVIDIA, and he's also the president of the Chronos Group. He talked at the Embedded Vision Conference, which is pretty much the biggest conference that Chronos Group does about a month and a half ago. And he pitched his big idea. And I'm going to show you the big idea in a second. It floored me. It's the most ambitious thing I've ever seen in computer science. You guys ready? Here it is. This is the, this is the formula for the singularity. What he essentially decided was how do you take XR and you build a system, a, a framework, so you can be training machine learning models in real time, running, doing inference in machine learning models in real time, capture the whole world in volumetric space, whether it be a light field, a point map, polygons, what have you, be running software on top of, of this, no matter where from, where to, and have it inter interact with Heterogeneous, soft, uh, heterogeneous hardware, heterogeneous sensors in a huge core. And uh, this, this is going to be the, the, this is the XR workflow for them all. And uh, it's coming to all the hardware you, you just saw and all the ones that is coming out. And uh, it's uh, pretty wild. Um, the really where this is, all, this is all getting sorted out right now is with the emerging standard of OpenXR, which really gets like sensors and the heart and the, and the software that runs on top of it and all the optics that runs on top of it into a common framework. And that's going to start in XR and blow out a bunch of different directions. And uh, the other side of this that's it's a very similar track that the Kronos Group is doing is in neural networks. Essentially they're building these interoperability formats, NMEF and Onyx. Uh, they both pretty much do the same thing and it pretty much allows you to take heterogeneous pieces of hardware run heterogeneous training systems for machine learning, get a common uh, uh, trained format, and then bring it over to heterogeneous inference systems. So you can go deploy your machine learning model on a phone, on a desktop, in an embedded piece of hardware, and they all run the same. It essentially allows you to go from anywhere to anywhere. So we're gonna see that with software, we're gonna see that with machine learning, we're gonna see that with uh, 3D models, and it's, it's all, it's the thing that's going to be most interesting is finding the common frameworks. So you guys, let's all take a breath. Here. Probably not um, Liam. <laughs> it sounds, I believe you, it sounds like we, we're going to have a holiday on our hands. And now I know what the next question is. Is it like that first episode in Star Trek The Next Generation where the holodeck's awesome? 
Or is it like every other episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where the holodeck tries to mind control you and then kill you, right? Like, what's the future of this, of this whole thing? Like, are, do we, do we really, uh, are we really ready for this transformative technology? And my answer to you is, well, it depends on who's controlling it. <laughs> okay? I have some of my opinions, and I don't know if the incumbent, you know, Fortune 1000 should be trusted with this beyond the next generation pipeline. Uh, I have my own thoughts. I started to think about the web browser. I love the web browser. I love building software for the web browser more than anything else. And because, and there's a reason behind that. The web is the most open and compatible place on the planet. I don't have to go to an app store. I don't have to pay somebody anything to go publish on the web. It's just me and the web. I hope it stays that way, quite frankly. So Mozilla wrote a really interesting paper in the end. You guys familiar with responsive design? You know how you have to go to a website that works on your phone, that works on your tablet, that works on your desktop, and it's all the same website? That's responsive design. Mozilla proposed a way to take responsive design and bleed it out into the metaverse. Can you take the same code that worked on your phone, your tablet, your desktop, go into AR, go into VR, go into headset AR, go into phone AR, go into headset VR, go into projection AR, do all of these things from the same code base. And there now is a way to do this, and people are developing against it. Uh, this just shows you uh, the, the software if you build a, a web mixed reality experience where you can use it, how you can use it. Uh, this is actually a little out of date. There's even more options now. And, uh, uh, and then, and then the, the big magic sauce is actually coming from the Chronos group, in my opinion. And this is the GLTF. Here is a very complicated infographic of a fairly complicated uh, uh, piece of uh, file standard. And you can kind of pick out a little bit of things here. You can represent hierarchies, you can represent polygons, you can modify them on the fly. This, thing, this GLTF is a great way to take 3D uh, objects and animations and transmit them and store them all very efficiently. You can see, you can build skeletons and, and deform them. You can do facial expressions and all sorts of things. The GLTF is a really robust way to encode the evidence. In my opinion, uh, it, it's this thing is going to dominate in the next few years, uh, all, all forms of industries. Uh, and uh, then, say you're sold, you want to actually start building stuff. Uh, the, the two technologies out, out now that are really built for building browser-based 3D, browser-based VR, are A-Frame and 3. A-Frame is built on top of 3, and they're all built on WebGL. Um, and soon WebGL will have many hooks into WebXR. And then if you want to take uh, what you built in virtual reality in 3D and bring it out in augmented reality, the uh, uh, first one to notice uh, is uh, ARJS. It's been around for a number of years. And it allows uh, any, anybody to do augmented reality in the web browser, no matter how old the phone is. Um, and it primarily uses markers, but it's very robust. Here's some markers we made. Here's some examples of it running. And uh, the new hotness is WebXR which allows uh, all of the uh, all of the greatness that we see in those in-app uh, VR frameworks, AR4 and AR kit, now exposed to the browser. Here's some stuff my team's working on. Here's some stuff that comes from Mozilla. And WebXR is about to hit real broadly, really quickly. I would say that the Chrome and Firefox are about three months out from you guys getting an app update. Uh, and if you have a, a, a newer phone, this stuff's just going to be enabled, and you're going to be able to start going to uh, AR websites, and it will just work, no marker or anything, and just as well as the stuff you see in the App Store. Uh, there's a, a lot of really great uh, high-end, uh, really great technology in the background, too, that is making the web able to do these incredible experiences. Just going down the list, uh, Webpack, which is this uh, awesome technology that's been around for about six years, that allows uh, the web to be broken down into, co into common components. Uh, WebAssembly, which is a really awesome technology that uh, is actually allowing us to compile uh, uh, web, uh, web code before it's delivered to you, 
So it'll run. Uh, so it'll download to your browser super quickly and then run really uh, uh, incredibly fast. And uh, we're gonna you're gonna see uh, browsers be able to give web pages a ton of RAM, and a ton of uh, computing, and a ton of uh, uh, GPU power. So it looks like a native app. It looks like something they would not be able to do. And then uh, last but not least, WebTorrent all the things around it. Uh, anybody heard of WebTorrent? I bet this is the one that you've heard of. WebTorrent is an incredible technology that uses uh, BitTorrent and BitTorrent-like backbones to allow all of us to pull our caches together uh, that run on the back of our browsers. So somebody can distribute out technology, uh, like a ton of files in real time, uh, and they don't have to be like a YouTube for it to, uh, uh, for like streaming video to be received by millions of people at once through a totally decentralized way. It's also great stuff to do with crypto blockchains on top of all of that. Uh, WebGL Angle requires a shout, shout out. That's uh, another great technology that's coming on online to really make uh, the web a place for 3D. And this all feeds into the next thing I want to talk about, which is something that most people don't really uh, know, which is computer vision and machine learning can now be done in the browser. Train in the browser, you can, and you can uh, run machine learning models in the browser. Uh, there, uh, the latest, the, the uh, latest instantiation of this technology is coming in shader compiled machine learning, where uh, machine learning uh, systems are actually compiled in the WebGL shaders so they can run in the browser through the GPU at speed. Uh, there's similar work being done with crypto shaders as well. That's really making the web the most interesting place to develop right now. Uh, so, I assume everybody's sold. <laughs> so I'm going to explain to you a little bit how it works. Uh, so you now, now you guys want to build the, your amazing, magical next-gen apps on the browser, and uh, you want to. And I'm going to show you kind of how it's going to run. So these are the the, the four major browsers out there, and uh, I figured I'd give you a little clue under the hood on uh, how this relates to uh, the underlying uh, Chronos technologies uh, that make it all possible. So the first one up is Mozilla, my favorite, and it's using WebGL Angle when I'm, when I'm building my AR, VR experience to talk down to the new hotness Vulkan, which is the operating system that's taken. Okay, let's actually start up a little bit. I think I'm getting a little dense. So, uh, so you, uh, you want to run a, a really killer uh, 3D, AR, VR, machine learning app. You're going to have to, uh, you're going to load it up on a web page, and then that web page is going to get opened up in a browser. And uh, that browser is going to have some 3D rendering horsepower uh, given to it, and it's going to have some access to sensors. And depending on uh, what browser you choose and what operating, operating system you want, you're on, you're going to get a slightly different experience. Uh, pretty much the best experience around is going to be Firefox. Uh, and you can just kind of follow this, this, this chart together. If you're on Android using Firefox, you're going to be using the latest and greatest uh, um, under, underlying systems, along with uh, a, 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 a ton of access to, to native sensors. Same thing with Linux. But uh, say if you're, if you're in op on, on uh, Windows, Windows is very biased towards their proprietary brain. And uh, you actually have to use a shim on top of their proprietary frameworks to, to get 3D to work. Uh, and then if you go to iOS, iOS again has its own proprietary framework. And they're also uh, very restrictive about uh, the way that web content can be viewed on their system. So they actually pretty much force you into Chrome for most everything. So Firefox had to build their own uh, WebXR viewer to get rich content onto the platform. And uh, through that, they actually got access to some great sensors. Uh, Safari um, is very behind in the pack. Uh, I think that's very deliberate on Apple's part. Apple very much wants all of this new type of technology to be going through their app store. So uh, you're just in their luck. Chrome is going very much a similar path to, uh, uh, to Firefox, except they, uh, you know, Google owns AR4. And they are currently working to integrate AR4 uh, into Chrome, uh, which will probably make it the first browser uh, in production to have this WebXR ability, this great AR uh, and machine learning abilities. 
Uh, and then there's Edge. And Edge is terrible, don't use Edge. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, so, uh, going, uh, just to give you an example, right here is some of the, uh, uh, my, in my opinion, some of my favorite uh, machine learning and computer vision uh, systems you can use in the browser. On the sound side, you have Mozilla Deep Speech, Mozilla Common Voice, um, uh, also uh, Replica, uh, Replica AI's Cake Chat, uh, able to do most anything you'd ever want to do with a voice or a conversational agent. And then uh, there's a long list of uh, facial recognition, object recognition, emotion recognition, pose recognition, AIs that can do computer vision and machine learning that I can recommend to. There's a few of them. Uh, I love this. It's, uh, it says that I got a 90% confidence that this thing's happy. Is that uh, and uh, here's here's uh, that pose uh, uh, the post tracking uh, algorithm that uh, post tracking machine learning uh, model that I showed before. Except here you can see it actually running live along with tuning. So these models, once they get loaded in the browser, they can be tuned. For instance, I can go track a single person to track a bunch of people. Um, you know, what, I can turn on and off the confidence, turn on and off the accuracy, turn on and off the resolution, and uh, tune it for the right lighting environment, the, the, the computer, the, the device it's running on, all on the fly. And then I put GLTF down here at the bottom because the most amazing thing is, is with uh, the, the machine learning can actually uh, assist with photogrammetry and the AR sensors to uh, enhance what it's sensing. Uh, such as building a 3D model, building a program, or building a skull. What was that uh, That was TensorFlow.js running PostNet. Um, if you guys uh, want to see some of this in play, uh, this is the first of two demos. Uh, this is uh, livescope.io slash XR. Pop it up, you'll see a portal to uh, a multiplayer VR experience. And let me just show you a little bit of that right there. Can you play the video? So this is a Social, uh, this is what we call the LifeScope XR Gallery. It's a social storytelling space uh, run in the web browser. And it runs on the phone, it runs on the desktop, it runs in uh, all sorts of VR headsets. And here you can see I was just showing the same presentation, except it's a multiplayer social space. And I can hop in with my friends, turn on the audio and video connection, turns on my webcam. And now I'm in here with my friends, talking, joshing around. I can walk through these portals. And uh, everything that happens inside here, I can, I, can, uh, I can actually record. You can see it, you can play rich media, through the objects. Um, and yeah, check it out. Uh, it's, this is actually, um, what we're building is a prototype virtual reality time machine. Uh, uh, you can see Thomas here. This is, uh, this is our, my rig at my house, our testing rig. You can see. You know, just uh, even this high-end, this very high-end laptop, very high-end headset is running along with all these phones, uh, all these other headsets, all into the same multiplayer space. When you say time machine, how much is that? Like, you you like talk about going to the key or the key or the You're. We'll get there in a sec. <laughs> Depends on my budget. I'm still working on. I'm working within a modest budget. Here, you can go on. Okay, well, um, yeah, and here's my team. Uh, they're all here tonight. Uh, we're just uh, uh, a modest group showing, showing what we, you can do with these web technologies. They really are an accelerating force because code wants to deploy everywhere. Um, they're all lovely. I'll just try to give them a round of applause at the end. Uh, and let's just get into kind of what I see in all of this. My team started to look at uh, all of these trends and uh, a, a very uh, a very interesting thought came to our head, which is, how are we going to manage all this new technology when we can barely ma man manage the technology we have, right? Like, uh, it's very hard to actually sit through and organize um, just the existing data we create and we try to ingest. So my team's been trying to build a way to actually, uh, it's called a PIM, a Personal Information Manager. We're trying to build a, uh, a way to actually organize all of our digital information so we can now take it into the next generation of experiences. 
uh, it is a, uh, it, we essentially see the, the internet as a vast, overwhelming, broken terrain of data in uh, which uh, we don't have a lot of data ownership, we don't have a lot of data control. So uh, what we've decided, is, what we've done is we built a system that works through your devices, works through the services you use, works through your web browsers, to bring all your information together in one place. And we organize it the way you think, into the people you know, the places you go, the physical things in your world, the digital content you interact with. And we, we create streams of information that are you. We then, uh, we, we then take this, work, this uh, information we collected and organized and hand it back to you. Uh, we're, we're trying to give everybody the empowerment of their own information so they can use it as a digital passport going forward. Uh, this is an example of the app. You literally just connect anything and everything you would like to track and organize, and you get a feed, like just a history tab of everything you've been up to. You can then search, search through it, say like, show me all my uh, photos from Hawaii, or show me inter every interaction with my best friend. And uh, you can create these saved searches of everything that you care about right at your fingertips, magically always open. It's currently stored in our cloud system, uh, which is encrypted uh, for everyone individually. But there's alternate options coming uh, to where to store it. Just to show you uh, uh, an example of this in play, this is just a sample 30 minute cut of my life in downtown Manhattan. And you can see I'm going from Midtown West to Columbus Circle. And I go take a phone call, I buy a hot dog, I get an email from my buddy Steve, uh, and I check in to meet my friend Lisa at Starbucks, and my whole life is plotted out in time and space. Uh, it's got a million and one use cases. Really, the, the whole experience with digital, digital devices is changed around uh, when your information is organized. And uh, we're, you know, we've been working on this for a number of years, and the place I always wanted to take it was the metaverse. You know, I always had that idea of, uh, have, you, have you guys ever seen the movie adaptations of H.G. Wells, The Time Machine, where it gets in the time machine, the world starts flying by, and the sun begins to streak across the sky. I would love to do that, be able to fly back to 10, 20 years ago, be able to uh, re go right where I, you know, see a photo, go right to where I was on Street View when I took that photo, uh, looking at Street View from 2006, while I look at the photo from 2006 up Times Square, and I feel like I have a perfect identity. Uh, digitally assisted. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking our data, plus a heap of geodata over time, uh, plus photogrammetry from all of our information, stringing it together to, with AI to build this complete story of you. And that's what LightScope is. Uh, this is our technical stack. I could get into it. Uh, but it's uh, this way to build on top of open standards in an open way. Uh, to make this type of vision scale. And, uh, you know, the, the, if you'd like to see another, uh, we have our augmented reality. And this is really around the idea of being able to take a stream of information off your life, say, like, everything you do with your job, or everything you do with your gaming trophy case, or, um, you know, your, your photo stream of your, of your children, or what have you, and turn it into a physical, dynamic object living scrapbook. And uh, here's an example of one of our, uh, uh, one of our WebXR prototypes. This is essentially a world covered with all the points and lines of everywhere you've been. You can place anywhere in your space. You can walk around. You can interact with it. And this is a global view. You can hear my breath really heavily. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and this is running in Chrome. Uh, and you can see there's no marker. And I'm able to walk around the entire experience, move in, move out. And this is, uh, this is all running from the universe of God. And I've amazed myself that nothing is fresh. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the next steps are uh, essentially solidifying this end-to-end -end system that we've built. And then starting to layer in more machine learning, more blockchain storage, uh, more essentially this intelligence and decentralization uh, to to really uh, make this the ultimate platform to encode all of our lives, a real objective reality.
Uh, and we built, we built this with trust and control in mind. You know, I think we've all seen the trends of Silicon Valley, and I don't think anybody wants these trends to continue. So, I started with the principle of building this nose-to-tail open source, building it in such a way that every, every, as much of it as possible is distributed, and making sure that people are not the products, that this is a product for people. And if you'd like to know more, uh, you can check out our website, my white paper, and the slides are online. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. So we built this for the individual and not the individual. So you use it for you, you have control. You, you create collect this for your information. Um, giving employers godlike amounts of power over you where they can see, yeah, they can, you know, how many times has James farted? Like, you know, you don't really want that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to if if I, I wish I had to be
So, um, you know, I, I'm actually going to be releasing this sort of like WordPress, where it's completely open source, so everybody can, can build on top of it. But we're reserving Livescope IO as to be a service, where uh, it's a freemium service where people are going to go. 90% uh, people, I think, are going to run their own node, their own like, live capture node. They're going to go to us, sign up, go, and we'll start them off with some very, some, some, some uh, the full capture experience, and then uh, the actual story sharing and all the great machine learning on top of that, I think people are going to pay for once they see the great ROI of having uh, artificial intelligence assist you in life. So. What did you call that hallway where it was, the fact that it was a gallery and then you on it? Yeah, we called it the XR gallery. It's, uh, a light, yeah. it's, it's, what, I, what I really want to get into is sort of like a memory palace-esque place where you can have like a generated Oh, I want to study my uh, my college notes. It generates me a house to be in my friends and study in my spatial number. So you click on that that picture and it and it opens up to the new. Um, no, no, but uh, we can talk about that later. So it's, there's a couple of concepts we're playing around here. Uh, none of that's really solidified yet. Turns out the metaverse is really hard to present. <laughs> uh, anything else, guys? I can go all night. I love talking about it. <laughs> When can we store our emails in Nefertiti's palace? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get on the collaboration experience on that. Well, I think everybody. Oh, yeah. I have to get that. You're not going to get that. No, who would just ask about it? I'm very curious about it. Um, the way they are, and like, immediately, uh, people that I work with struggle a lot with being compatibility and reliability. Um, and, like, is that. How, how close do you see that stuff on the horizon? Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I think that was super fun.